Some say that if we live in a godless universe, there's no basis for morality. That is, principles concerned with the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behaviour or character. However, for many others, religion is the problem. Their rejection of religion, far from being motivated by a wish to escape moral accountability, as some claim, reflects a conviction that it's only through abandoning certain widespread religious ideas that progress towards a truly just and consistent morality is possible. This video series highlights some of the flaws in popular religious moral arguments and teachings, and offers a moral outlook that makes no use of God concepts, and is thus available to theists and atheists alike, refuting the profound misconception that gods are needed for morality. So on what do we base morality? We know it's not power. The one with the gun might have the means to impose their wishes, but this tells us nothing about their principles. We know it's not majority preference. If the spectacle of human sacrifice is the preferred entertainment of the majority, this doesn't make human sacrifice right. We know it's not tradition. The fact that a practice may have endured for generations tells us nothing about its virtue. And although what's written in law may largely reflect what a society deems right or wrong, we know law doesn't determine morality. Laws can be unjust. When asking this question, it can be useful to consider how we go about assessing moral problems. In Society 1, children are branded witches and blamed for famines and floods. They're ostracised by their parents, starved, tortured and killed. What can we say about this? Well, we know these disasters aren't due to magic, but natural processes. So before even having to consider the moral dimension, we can reject this behaviour outright, as resulting from a false view of how nature works. What makes it a moral matter is the kind of harm it involves. For things that cause no harm, moral condemnation simply isn't appropriate. For example, homosexuality is often misidentified as a moral issue, but gay relationships involve no intrinsic harm, any more than mixed ones. Indeed, when classing harmless things as immoral results in persecution, we've reason to condemn the misclassification. Are the parents in Society 1 morally blameworthy if they're genuinely ignorant of their wrongdoing? We don't call well-fed cats that still kill mice, or young humans who create on expensive wallpaper immoral, because we don't attribute them with the capacity to grasp reasons for not doing so. People who harm children as witches may have their capacity for reason undermined by false teaching, and so be less blameworthy than knowing abusers. In a very important sense, moral responsibility can be said to operate within the limits of education. This is why education, especially in science, is crucial to moral progress. Among other things, it helps eliminate our vulnerability to superstition-based abuse. Knowing better leaves us no excuse for not doing better. Once the justification for a harmful practice is shown as false, there's literally no reason for it to continue. Scenario 1 is also about dehumanisation. When the witch finder convinces a parent her child is evil, even demonic, this is a potent way of eroding empathy, an adaptive pro-social trait notably lacking in psychopaths, which keeps us sensitive to others' suffering. During World War II, Jews were seen as vermin by their persecutors. Some paint the non-religious as degenerate or hell fodder. Dehumanising people is a known method for diminishing compassion and the guilt felt when abusing them. We learn much from history and the present day about the horrors it can enable. In Society 2, the single lawmaker tells everyone, All who harm you will be punished, but you won't be punished for harming others. A and B harm each other. But when they each quote the first part of the law, demanding the other's punishment, the other quotes the second part, demanding immunity from punishment. According to the law, A and B must be both punished and immune from punishment. This is the kind of absurdity that results from having an egocentric system, where only one's own suffering, desires and so on matter. If suffering is bad in principle, then claiming it's wrong for others to hurt you while you hurt others would be appealing to the same notion of justice that requires you to recognise your own wrongdoing. This is why not only does it reduce suffering, it's also rationally consistent to have basic prohibitions against causing needless harm to other humans, and by extension other life forms that we know have the capacity to experience suffering. Besides, part of morality's essence is adopting a plural view, recognising our impact on others and adjusting our conduct in response. Of course, sometimes causing harm is rationally permitted. For example, we risk painful medical procedures if there's a compensating benefit to our health. And sometimes we have sufficient justification to harm others when acting in self-defence or to prevent greater suffering. In Society 3, only males are allowed to learn to read and write. Is this just? Well, we know there's no valid basis for making basic literacy dependent on gender. 
We know the real reason institutions and individuals have restricted basic education throughout history is to keep others subservient. As noted earlier, poor education increases vulnerability to abuse. Forbidding female literacy is itself a mark of bad education and the unjust exercise of authority. But what if most of the women agree with this rule? Is it then acceptable? If an eight-year-old consents to an adult's sexual advances, are the advances acceptable? Of course not. This is why we don't talk only about consent, but capacity for informed consent. People kept purposely uneducated can reasonably be said to have diminished capacity for informed consent. The rule is oppressive in its construction, even if the women agree with it. Indeed, when people who've been made subservient collaborate in their own oppression, this is normally cause for greater concern, not less. Those who defend their abusers are the most comprehensively enslaved. In Society 4, all criminals are executed. Assessing this rule, we can see it's flawed, but not only because disproportionate punishment is unjust. Under this rule, those who commit minor crime have nothing to lose but all to gain by killing witnesses, even suspected witnesses. Murder can't increase the consequences for them. It can only inflate their chances of evading execution. In this way, execution for all crime actually encourages minor crime to escalate. This gives us a reason to tailor punishment to the severity of the offence, especially within the category of more serious crime. For example, although rape is a horrific form of abuse, punishing murder more severely will tend to deter rapists from also killing their victims. As before, with indiscriminate execution, the rapist loses nothing, but might gain, by also committing murder. In Society 5, the Premier declares smiling on a Tuesday immoral. This causes no identifiable harm, so there are no valid grounds for declaring it immoral. Nor can it be made immoral by forbidding it in law and then saying it's immoral to break the law. If this was how morality worked, any arbitrary behaviour could be made immoral. We don't base morality on revelation from authority. That would render us merely obedient. Moral behaviour is doing what's right, not what we're told. Unless, of course, what we're told is also what's right. This is why when asking why is X immoral, appealing to scripture or supposed divine commands gets us nowhere. There must be enough to be said for or against a given action, independently of whether it's commanded or forbidden by authority, to class it as moral or immoral. If intuition tells us something's immoral, we ask what triggers the intuition. There must be valid reasons. And once we're dealing with valid reasons, we're having a conversation that has no need to refer to scripture or authority, divine or otherwise. Valid reasons are available to us all. Lastly, in Society 6, feeding someone chocolate and making green paintings are prohibited. But the people of this society have a genetic intolerance of chocolate. It causes them agonising death. They also live on a remote island where green paint can only be made with a rare substance needed for a life-saving medicine. Differing biology or practical circumstances can explain why some populations live by different rules. Also, different cultures may deal effectively with the same issue despite different approaches. But this doesn't commit us to saying all cultures are equally valid. Because some cultural differences are justified, it doesn't mean all are. As noted earlier, branding children witches is categorically wrong. To be rejected as a result of bad education, not respected as a cultural truth. The fact that some cultures still have cruel practices does not mean morality is therefore arbitrary and all opinions are equal. It simply reflects the fact that just as moral awareness takes time to develop in an individual, it also takes time to develop in societies, with different societies developing at different rates. Some societies still believe in magic. Some have largely outgrown belief in magic, but not animal cruelty, racism, sexism or homophobia. Some have largely outgrown all of these, and are focused on advances in other areas affecting the well-being of life forms on our planet. Reviewing these scenarios, it should be noted there's nothing arbitrary about the arguments given for improving education, graduating criminal punishment, prohibiting needless harm, and recognising relevant difference. It's through such measures, as well as cultivating attitudes of cooperation and compromise, despite competing interests, that we're able to coexist with minimal suffering. The worry that without religion or gods we've no basis on which to discuss morality is without foundation. Plain empathy can trigger natural help responses to others' distress and create natural aversion to causing others harm. 
Likewise, the simple experience of living alongside others gives us important feedback about how our actions affect each other and how we might need to modify our conduct in response. But two prerequisites for reliable moral assessment are reason and accurate relevant information. Sound reasoning won't lead to valid assessments if we're operating with flawed information, nor will sound information if our reasoning's flawed. Without sound reason and information, we can't determine how the universe works, how different life forms suffer or flourish, where responsibility lies, or what the short or long-term consequences of our actions are on an interpersonal or global scale. And these are considerations on which moral judgment depends. So often declared the territory of religion, moral development is in fact something to which the scientific approach contributes far more, and far more reliably, due to its emphasis on reasoned logic and evidence the tools that help us discern what's true and false, and without which one can't even formulate a valid argument. To make informed moral choices and therefore moral progress, religion needs science, but science does not need religion. Indeed, findings in neuroscience are now pulling back the curtain on religious moral thought. In a revealing study by Nicholas Epley and others, Christian volunteers were asked to report their own views, the views of their deity, and the views of others on a range of controversial issues such as legal euthanasia, while having their brain activity scanned. Results showed that thinking about divine views activated the same brain regions as thinking about their own views, indicating that when believing themselves to be consulting a divine moral compass, theists may instead be doing what the rest of us do, searching their own conscience an idea further supported by the finding that manipulating subjects' beliefs consistently influence their views about divine beliefs. As Epley's team put it, intuiting God's beliefs may serve as an echo chamber to validate and justify one's own beliefs. Some claim that without gods we're just animals. We are animals, but animals uniquely capable of appreciating reasons to do some things and not others of rationally assessing the consequences and justifications of our actions and beliefs. Whereas certain religions have traditionally used moral language to divide, control and frighten people into obedience, there's a more appropriate and principled function for morality, to ease the challenges of coexistence. In a world of finite resources, each of us with different interests and desires, societies in which individuals coordinate their different talents and that develop effective ways of promoting flourishing and harmonious living while minimising conflict and needless suffering will tend to be happier, more peaceful and more productive than those that don't. Because we live in a continuously changing world with new kinds of moral problem being generated all the time and much harmful ignorance still to overcome, there's an ongoing need to develop and refine our moral understanding. Our collective moral progress depends upon the extent to which we are able, and crucially willing, to examine our behaviour and most cherished beliefs in the light of increasing awareness of our predicament, and then share our moral insights through education, so that future generations can avoid repeating our harmful and foolish mistakes. The next video in this series takes a more detailed look at problems with using religious scripture as a moral guide. Imagine your society has a new leader who publicises four laws they intend to phase in as follows. Law 1. Any citizen who talks on a Friday will be executed. The leader was born on a Friday and didn't talk and wants this respected in law. Law 2. Your leader can kill citizens or order their killing for any reason. Law 3. Any citizen forced by your leader to commit crimes through mind-altering drugs will be punished. Law 4. Parents who commit crime will have their children killed, and if it's not their first offence, they'll be made to eat their children. These laws would no doubt spark outrage. Law 1 kills people for crime with no victim. Law 2 makes the lawmaker unaccountable by declaring their own killings lawful by definition. Laws 3 and 4 explicitly punish the blameless, directly contradicting the principle of personal responsibility, with Law 4 adding an obscene element designed to dehumanise. They're definitive cases of injustice. So if asked about our objections to these laws, we're not confined to saying they're not to our taste. We have non-arbitrary reasons to object. These laws would lead to clearly identifiable abuses. We know too much about what constitutes harmful behaviour, suffering and responsibility to allow such laws to be incorporated into our justice systems. But what if this leader's been in office all your life and you've been brought up to think they're morally perfect? Such a lawmaker wouldn't make laws that were unjust, so this would create major cognitive dissonance. How would we respond? 
Perhaps we'd invent some context in which of course it's right for someone who'd done so much for the society to make some essentially arbitrary demands. Or perhaps we'd try to evade the problem by saying their grasp of morality was so far ahead of ours we couldn't understand them, that they worked in mysterious ways. But we'd be wrong. Clearly the root of the problem is the false and morally corrupting idea that the lawmaker is perfect. It's corrupting because in causing us to accept unjust laws, it leaves us defending the indefensible. Remove this idea and we can see the unjust laws for what they are. When we accept ideas uncritically, or make them sacred so we don't question them, this can distort our moral reasoning, because we're then prone to having mistaken ideas ruling our attitudes and behaviour outside our awareness. Those who've swallowed whole or interjected the idea, the lawmaker is perfect, cannot properly evaluate the law until this distorting idea is identified and removed. Identifying ideas we've swallowed whole is sometimes the key to resolving problems in many areas of life. When we consider the traits attributed to the biblical deity Yahweh, clearly, if it existed, it couldn't be better placed to mete out fair, consistent justice. We're told it knows our thoughts, knows who's guilty or innocent, and is perfectly moral. So unlike human justice administrators, it would have no excuse for punishing anyone but the guilty, or for punishing them disproportionately. And yet according to the Bible, it permits, commits, and commands the vilest atrocities corresponding directly to the laws we've just rejected. It orders the killing of those who work on the Sabbath, gay people and women who show insufficient evidence of virginity on their wedding night. It kills 70,000 people when David takes a census, at Yahweh's request, and kills almost all land animals by flooding for human wickedness. It hardens the hearts of the Pharaoh, the Egyptians and the King of Heshbon through mind control to enable their defeat and destruction. It sends a powerful delusion to make certain people believe a lie, just so they can be condemned. And it deceives prophets into giving false messages, then punishes them for doing so. Having stated no child will be killed for its father, it orders the killing of children for their father's sins, the killing of Amalekite infants, the killing of children without pity. And at least three books in the Bible see Yahweh sink to announcing one of the most depraved punishments we could imagine, making people eat their own families. Some claim that if the monotheistic God doesn't exist, everything is permitted. In fact, if we accept the Bible, the reverse is true. The Bible tells us explicitly that Yahweh has not only permitted, but endorsed rape, slavery, the killing of babies, familial cannibalism, and mass murder. It is Yahweh that permits everything. When our judgment isn't impaired by false teaching, we can plainly see the injustices here as we did with the Four Laws. But what if we've been brought up to think that Yahweh really exists and is morally perfect, and this now rules our judgment? How do we respond to these acts? Declare them just? We know that killing those known not to be responsible for the sins being punished is quintessentially unjust. Do we concoct elaborate justifications? No. When we indulge any impulse to excuse or defend these acts, we're already going dangerously astray. If we justify these acts, what won't we justify? Do we brush Yahweh's cruelties under the carpet of symbolism, claiming they're not meant to be taken literally? Nothing in the Bible makes clear that Yahweh's infanticides are purely symbolic, but even if they were, the idea of an omnibenevolent baby punisher makes no more sense as a symbol than as a literal being. Do we claim these particular passages are beyond our understanding? Not only is that unconvincing, when we condemn humans who act this way without hesitation, it represents one of the most deplorably irresponsible attitudes towards morality and justice we can encounter. We can't paper over these serious issues by declaring the existence of a supernatural being with unfathomable behaviour. Nor should we be duped into thinking this response shows humility. Admitting we don't understand everything about the universe is humble. Saying we don't understand that making people eat their children is a depraved punishment, even if it's ordered by a god, is an inexcusable abdication of critical judgment. But if one does argue there's a god that works in mysterious ways, ways that utterly contradict our notions of moral behaviour, then its nature is clearly not the source of our morality. If, according to the Bible, Yahweh's nature deems familial cannibalism a just punishment, yet we'd call any human who devised such a punishment depraved, then these positions are in direct conflict, and invoking divine mystery does nothing to resolve that conflict. 
Responding to these atrocities with examples of mercy doesn't work either. It just shows the Bible contains both mercy and atrocity. Some emphasise the New Testament above the Old, shifting focus from Yahweh to the comparative gentleness of Jesus. But in Matthew 15, Jesus endorses Yahweh's order to kill those who curse their parents, presumably including Tourette sufferers, whose cursing results from neurological disorder. Two of the Gospels have the bizarre story of Jesus punishing a fig tree, making it wither because it has no fruit when he's hungry, even though it's not the season for it to bear fruit. This is like smashing a TV set on Friday because the Sunday film isn't showing. It's unstable behaviour, a tantrum. Some apologists say Jesus is reinforcing the parable of the barren fig tree, a comment on fruitless people. But that doesn't hold water. The tree he curses isn't barren. His words show he is stopping it from bearing fruit again. Also, later verses reveal that the main point of this miracle is to show that with enough faith, one can literally move mountains. This is merely a display of destructive power against a healthy tree to show Jesus' dominance over nature and to convince his disciples that they shall receive whatever they desire if they pray with enough conviction, a questionable message in itself. Jesus tells a man wishing to follow him that he can't go back to inform his family. The man must instantly dispose of his closest relationships. No option even to fetch his family so they can all follow. These are Christian family values according to the Bible. The good news of Jesus is not so good. Of course, as before, what's at the root of all these familiar responses is a false belief. Once we realise the biblical God doesn't exist, once we overcome our reluctance to question an idea fed to us when we were least able to evaluate it, an idea we trained some of us even threatened not to question, the dissonance disappears and we stop having to torture logic to disguise Yahweh's injustice. A perfectly just being wouldn't order the killing of innocents. It wouldn't create problems or violate the principle of responsibility by using mind control to induce punishable behaviour. It wouldn't regulate abusive practices such as slavery, but condemn them. Nor would it punish disproportionately. Declaring something perfect, then using that declaration to infer that everything it does is perfect, is not how valid reason works. When one argues for the existence of a God that's perfect in its justice, love and honesty, these are highly specific and highly fragile claims. A being with these qualities can't do just anything. Many behaviours will by definition lie outside its possible repertoire. If it punishes the innocent or makes use of deception, any claim to perfect virtue shatters into incoherence. Perfection is an absolute, and when Yahweh uses deception, regardless of the reasons apologists put forward for this behaviour, the use of deception in and of itself destroys the claim that Yahweh is perfectly honest. Many who reject theism are told they owe their morality to religion, that they borrow moral capital from Judeo-Christian tradition. Even if this were true, the Judeo-Christian tradition borrowed from what came before. It wasn't the monotheistic religions that invented prohibitions against murder, theft or perjury. These prohibitions promote peaceful coexistence, and we're doing so long before the Bible's writers were born, so the claim that we borrow moral capital already rings hollow. But more importantly, if the Judeo-Christian tradition reflects the Bible, an epic set of texts in which practices across the entire moral spectrum are endorsed and permitted from virtuous to vicious, it's no more valid to say we borrow from this than to say we borrow from a hypothetical human whose extensive catalogue of good and bad deeds range from charity to mass murder. Something that spans the entire moral spectrum will by definition have some great virtue in it, but this doesn't mean we use it as a moral guide. When the mass murdering charity worker stands trial, the charity doesn't make up for the murders, and the murders destroy any claim that he's a role model. Likewise, the many immoral teachings in the Bible provide the grounds on which we must condemn these passages outright as morally disgraceful and reject any suggestion that the Bible is a source of reliable revelation. We cannot trust the Bible as a moral guide, but it's even worse than that. The insanity of the Bible is that what it permits in one passage it prohibits in another. The making of images or likenesses of anything from earth or heaven is both forbidden and commanded. People are ordered to stone others to death, yet only those without sin are fit to cast the first stone, and we're told no one is without sin. We're told good deeds must be shown and not shown. These conflicting requirements defy rationality. 
Of course, much of the Bible's appeal depends on its countless moral inconsistencies, which enable almost anyone to find passages that endorse their particular view. Some find passages to support their bigotry, some to validate their thirst for blood. Others focus on passages endorsing peace and acceptance. But books that endorse all viewpoints ultimately endorse none. Non-Christians who cite biblical cruelties are often accused of cherry-picking. In fact, non-Christians can freely acknowledge both kindness and cruelty in the Bible. But clearly it's the cruelties that should concern any decent person. It's those who ignore the immoral content of religious scripture who are truly cherry-picking. Theists who discard the less palatable parts of scripture should at least be honest about the standards by which they do this and concede that they are applying their own independent judgment to scripture. Obviously, when we use our own moral sense to separate good and bad in scripture, when we revise our interpretations of it to reflect the more enlightened view of our time, it isn't scripture guiding our morality, but our morality guiding our perception of scripture. The Bible is an extraordinary set of texts. However, what it gives us is not the word of a perfect being, but a fascinating record of the inconsistent beliefs and customs of ancient people, as described by a disparate assortment of fallible human authors writing centuries ago, borrowing extensively from others' mythology, and giving frequently conflicting versions of events never witnessed by the authors, but circulated for decades by word of mouth. Many of these authors felt the mass extermination of lives was honourable behaviour for a god, confusing morality with power, and they poured this flawed understanding into their writings. But if their ancient minds failed to see the cruelty and contradiction in what they wrote, it should not be invisible to us now, and we do ourselves grave injustice if we enshrine their ignorance in our morality. They didn't know better. We do. Religious scripture is fixed in distant history, and its many endorsements of cruelties we don't tolerate today make this abundantly evident. It's not a virtue of religious dogma that it doesn't change. It's the most profound failing. Moral systems that can't develop in response to advances in our understanding cannot edify. They ossify. Moral considerations, far from leading us to embrace the so-called good books, are exactly what should lead us to reject them. The next video in the series looks closer at the nature of morality and will include discussion of objectivity, subjectivity and the is-ought problem. A formal moral argument sometimes put forward for divine existence runs as follows. Premise 1. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Premise 2. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Conclusion. Therefore God exists. According to William Lane Craig, a proponent of this argument, to say there are objective moral values is to say something is good or evil independently of whether anybody believes it to be so. But if moral values are independent of everyone's evaluation, this leaves Craig with significant problems. One is that if two humans perform an action, one thinking it evil, the other having no sense that it's evil, what they believe about their behaviour is not irrelevant to our moral assessment. If someone's genuinely ignorant of what they do, we don't accept their harmful behaviour, and we restrain it if possible, but we don't call it evil. Craig's idea that something is evil, whether or not anyone believes so, clearly doesn't reflect the way we tend to make moral judgments. The idea of evil is only relevant in proportion to an agent's understanding, which is one reason we don't judge other animals by human standards. Craig thinks non-believers who see anything special about human morality have succumbed to the temptation of speciesism. But noting that humans have greater capacity for moral reflection than other species is not, as Craig insists, an unjustifiable bias. It's a relevant difference. In fact, given Craig's own claim that no moral dimension exists for non-human animals, the real speciesist would be Craig's God. After all, what do we make of a being that, according to Craig, has decided that only one species is morally accountable, so that the human child killer is evil, but the lion that kills other lion's cubs does nothing wrong? However, a more basic problem for Craig is that values are the result of the evaluation process. Moral values refer to what we judge morally valuable or important. So to say they apply independently of anyone's evaluation, that some things have unevaluated value, becomes unintelligible. It also lacks any practical application. We may dismiss things right now which, given other information, we'd value, but we can't go beyond the range of our own awareness to see how unknown information would alter our values. 
So unknown values, even if they existed, would only be relevant from the moment of their discovery, at which point it would be far less metaphysically extravagant to say we'd simply then made an evaluation than say we'd discovered an unevaluated value. It's true that given more complete information, justifications for certain attitudes and behaviour will be exposed as false. It's true that there can be subjective facts. If you burn your finger, the pain you feel won't be merely a matter of opinion, even though it's subjective. It's also true, as John Mackey notes, that given sufficiently specified standards of morality, it will be an objective issue, a matter of truth and falsehood, how well any particular specimen measures up to those standards. Of course, the choice of standards still won't be objective, but nor will it be completely arbitrary, because what we value isn't completely random, but highly influenced by the kind of creature we are. So we can agree with Craig when he says, most people think there's an objective difference between torturing a child and caring for it, that these are not morally indifferent acts. However, just because we distinguish torture from caring and find one bad and the other good, that doesn't mean we have to agree with Craig that these behaviours are therefore good or evil, independently of what anyone thinks. Some defend objective values by claiming moral value is a property we detect with a special faculty of moral perception. But notice this is no longer supporting divine existence, as the moral argument is claimed to, only proposing new phenomena in need of their own independent support, and each has problems. For example, how can it be shown that if someone says Q is morally good, they've detected a value of goodness that's part of Q itself, rather than simply made a subjective evaluation that it's good? We can't appeal to consensus. Agreement that Q is good still doesn't tell us that the goodness is part of Q, rather than something we're ascribing. And besides, this particular moral argument deems agreement irrelevant. Nor can we appeal to innate tendencies. Even if we can be shown to have an innate predisposition to find Q good, that wouldn't show Q has objective goodness. It would only indicate we're innately predisposed to value Q subjectively. We may value life. But sliding from I value life to life has objective value makes the same mistake as sliding from I find slugs revolting to slugs are intrinsically revolting. It's falsely projecting our own attitude onto the object of our attitude. As Mackey notes, our wants and demands give rise to the notion of objective values by reversing the direction of dependence. So that instead of seeing our evaluation of a thing's goodness depend on our desire, our desire for a thing is seen to depend on the thing's goodness. Saying intuition lets us know what's morally good or bad also needs to be challenged. The weaker claim that moral intuition is a kind of instinctive judgment can be granted. It's true that instinctive feelings can lead us to judge actions immoral without conscious reasoning. Empathy, for example, leads us quickly to apprehend the distress of a child being attacked, and a moral judgment may arrive in our awareness almost instantly. Our brains process information rapidly, and it's easy to see how having protective instincts came to give us an advantage while trying to survive together on a hostile planet. But having useful, advantageous instincts isn't evidence that we're accessing objective moral knowledge. We do well to treat our intuitions with more caution. They frequently mislead us. Contrary to appearances, these squares aren't moving, which you can test by pausing the video, but we seem hardwired to make a false interpretation. Much of what we discover about ourselves and the world is counterintuitive. For example, we tend to care and donate more when charities show us cases of single rather than mass suffering. In a fascinating article looking at this identifiable victim effect, Paul Slovich notes how we're generally less affected as the number of victims presented to us increases, and discusses the unsettling implications this has for our moral tendencies. Sometimes what one intuits to be self-evidently morally bad, another intuits to be self-evidently morally neutral. If they each appeal to intuition, this only tells us that they each know they're right. To make a valid case, they need to do more. The subjective experience of believing a thing to be so obvious as to require no explanation is not self-guaranteeing. And this is especially true with morality, where people are prone to mistaking feelings for moral knowledge. While intuition might be a source of useful questions, our brains are too error-prone to regard it as a reliable source of objective answers. Moving to moral duties. When Craig says, to say we have objective moral duties is to say we have certain moral obligations regardless of whether we think we do, this is a concept with similar empirical and conceptual problems. If absolutely no one is aware of a duty to do X, the idea of having such a duty gets no purchase. 
Again, there's no problem saying that given better information, justifications based on false understanding get eliminated, while new justifications will emerge. If the members of Society X are generally protective of others, but mistake mental disorder for demon possession, which they see as a threat, they may feel a moral duty consistent with these attitudes, namely a duty to destroy the perceived threat. If they outgrow their belief in possession and learn about brain dysfunction, they may feel a new duty to care for those with mental disorder. It's not that they discover a hitherto unknown objective duty to help rather than harm these people. It's that given an initially protective attitude, their sense of duty changes in response to changes in information. As before, much of the sense of what we ought to do may come initially from instinct rather than conscious reasoning. Again, empathic instincts influence much of our behaviour, and it's easy to see how this instinct would evolve, how natural selection would favour groups of humans whose instinct was to protect each other over individuals trying to survive on a hostile planet with no one to protect them. But as before, having advantageous instincts that motivate us to behave or stop behaving in a certain way isn't evidence that we have objective duties. In the 18th century, David Hume objected to the way authors on morality shifted from statements connected by is or is not to others connected by ought or ought not, which he said express a new relation. To Hume, it seemed inconceivable that ought relationships were deducible from is ones, which he saw as entirely different. This is commonly interpreted to mean we can't infer what we morally ought to do from purely factual premises. We can't derive an ought from an is. But further reading gives a different emphasis. Here's what Hume says about willful murder. The vice entirely escapes you as long as you consider the object. You'll never find it till you turn your reflection into your own breast and find a sentiment of disapprobation which arises in you towards this action. Here is a matter of fact, but tis the object of feeling. It lies in yourself, not in the object. In other words, evil isn't a feature of murder, but a judgment arising from sentiment. When Hume objects to the shift from is to ought, he's criticising those who mistake their own feelings about murder for intrinsic qualities of murder, echoing the aforementioned error of projecting one's own attitude onto the object of that attitude. Of course, whatever Hume's original meaning, the idea that we can't derive moral oughts from factual is statements has spawned a great deal of debate in our own time. But is the so-called is ought problem really a problem? All it's saying is that moral obligations aren't deducible purely from non-moral facts. And this seems quite true if moral obligations involve emotional elements. I don't like pain. My dislike of pain isn't arbitrary. I'm biologically biased to dislike it. Indeed, the aversive quality of pain protects us by prompting our retreat from harmful stimuli. Knowing also that I've no valid basis for thinking my comfort is uniquely important, if I want others not to hurt me, then to avoid hypocrisy, this obliges me not to hurt them. This obligation isn't unconditional. It arises largely from biologically influenced preferences. Some say preference has no role in our morality. After all, rapists like raping, but we don't say they ought to rape. But of course that's misleading. Morality has never meant doing whatever you prefer, no matter who it hurts. Part of morality's essence is considering our impact on others, and asking why rapists shouldn't do what they prefer completely ignores the preference of the victim. No one's saying all preferences are morally relevant, but some are. We have numerous moral prohibitions about inflicting pain. That our dislike of pain is a preference doesn't diminish its relevance. When we dissect any moral obligation, we always find some element of preference, even if it's a preference largely determined by biology. As Mackey notes, for any argument that supports an evaluative conclusion, where this conclusion has some action-guiding force that's not contingent upon desires or purposes or chosen ends, somewhere in the input to this argument there will be something which cannot be objectively validated, some premise which is not capable of being simply true, or some form of argument which is not valid as a matter of general logic, whose authority or cogency is not objective. Craig claims that if God does not exist, there's no ground for objective moral duties because there's no moral lawgiver, the implication being that a lawgiver could provide that ground. But this is false. Lawgivers are still subjective beings and their presence doesn't guarantee objectivity. Even if a divine lawgiver required certain duties of us, all that would be necessarily true is that it required duties of us. It wouldn't follow that the duties were therefore objectively good or grounded. Craig thinks he can achieve objective grounding by making use of Anselm of Canterbury's notion of a greatest conceivable being. 
According to Anselm's ontological argument, one can understand what's meant by a greatest conceivable being, so such a being can exist at least in thought. But if it exists only in thought, one can think of a greater being, existing in thought and reality. Therefore, Anselm insists, if one claims to be able to conceive of a greatest being, without ascribing to it real existence, one is contradicting oneself. He later inflates this being to one not only that exists, but whose non-existence is inconceivable. Of the well-known flaws in this argument, perhaps the most basic, is that even if person A has in her mind a concept of a greatest conceivable being, no logic requires her concept to correspond with reality. As Kant points out, whatever and however much our concept of an object may contain, we must go outside the concept if we're to attribute the object with existence. No ontological argument establishes that there must be a god, that this god must have an essential nature, or that that essential nature must be good, which leaves Craig's claim to objective grounding no more than the unsupported assertion of a god and of the qualities Craig wants it to have to make his moral case. We value generosity, compassion and fairness because we experience and appreciate their positive effects. When they're proclaimed as divine qualities, this isn't because anyone's observed such qualities in a god. No god has yet been established to exist, let alone one whose nature we can study. All that's happening is that qualities we've already judged independently to have value are being ascribed to an entity declared to exist and to be good by definition. If we want to imagine an idealised being as a way of developing some basic principles of conduct, the most appropriate model would be something with human biology. Rooting morality in a being beyond our comprehension only pushes morality beyond our comprehension. It's even worse when what we choose as a model is a god of ancient scripture, depicted violating moral principles we hold to be most basic. When we tell ourselves there's an all-powerful entity that can do this, yet still be morally perfect, we create the very conditions that, far from leading us to moral truth, guarantee our moral confusion. Even if a god created our universe, nothing about the act or power of grand creation requires moral perfection. And even if our universe was created by a god that was somehow intrinsically good, no logic would require that being still to exist. Imagine such a god existed yesterday, but destroyed itself today. Would torture suddenly stop being a moral issue? If so, this god clearly couldn't have embodied values of enduring relevance, severing any connection with objective moral value. If not, we're admitting the god doesn't need to exist, destroying this moral argument's conclusion. There'd be equally overwhelming problems with claiming that moral values and duties are transcendental in nature, and therefore require a supernatural creator. As soon as we require things to be imbued supernaturally with goodness, badness or oughtness, as soon as we allow the supernatural to feature in any of our explanations, the idea of a single supreme deity becomes just one of countless unknowable, untestable concepts, all with their own ad hoc justifications. In a video I made with theremin trees called Betting on Infinity, we look at what those floodgates let in. In this case, transcendental values and duties could just as easily be the creation of a group of supernatural experimenters, arbitrarily making things good and bad, so as to study the effect on animal behaviour. If moral values and duties were the kinds of things that had to be created supernaturally, this alone would count against their objective validity. A perennial problem with arguments for divine existence is that even if they were valid, they still wouldn't provide a logical pathway to the god of any particular religion or scripture. Reviewing this moral argument, the implication of premise one that the existence and only the existence of one god could ground moral objectivity is not established. Not only do objective values and duties lack necessary support, We've good reason to reject those concepts as incoherent, leaving premise two, and therefore the conclusion, undemonstrated. This moral argument does not establish the existence of any god. The motive for objectifying moral values and duties is understandable. As Mackey notes, since we need morality to regulate interpersonal relations, often against people's natural inclinations, we therefore want our moral judgments to be authoritative, and many think only objectivity can achieve this authority. In the words of Thomas Nagel, there's a tendency to seek an objective account of everything before admitting its reality. But often what appears to a more subjective point of view cannot be accounted for in this way. The common misconception that if morality isn't entirely objective, it's subjective and therefore only opinion or arbitrary, has obscured and hijacked much of the discourse on the subject and should be discarded. In video 4, 
building on themes in previous videos, I'll be discussing the origins and components of a more rounded morality, relevant to theists and non-believers alike, and this will include a look at utility, rules and consequences.